Well, thank you all for, for being here, and thank you for allowing me to, to talk to you about uh, my work. Um, I, I, I should say that I spent last year at the APS working on another book project, um, actually about, well, not that guy, but about Franklin, um, Franklin and money, and uh, so I feel very at home here and, and have been coming here for one reason or another related to my various scholarly uh, activities for about 30 years. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, um, I feel compelled to, to, to iterate something that everyone in the room knows, which is that this is a, an unbelievably valuable cultural resource, um, not just for history, uh, you know, dedicatees like me, but, uh, but for, the, for the nation. Um, so uh, it's a great pr privilege to be here, and I, I thank you for, uh, for, for allowing me to, to speak with you today. Um, so I'm actually going to talk about a book that I published uh, in 2016. Um, this is uh, the cover of the book. Um, again, more beneficence from the APS. Uh, the APS is going to issue a, a new edition, a new paperback edition of the book next year. So I'm, I'm immensely grateful for that. It's very exciting uh, for me. Um, um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the subject matter of the book. And I think the best way to do this is uh, 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 to characterize it as two very closely related stories, one of which is perhaps familiar to you, and one is perhaps a little bit less familiar. So, and I'm going to try to stick close to script here, so I, I'm very intimidated by that clock. Um, um, so the familiar story recounts the life of Thomas Paine, and you can see him here in this engraving based on a no longer, or a, what's believed to be a lost George Romney portrait from 1792. And Paine is generally agreed to have been the American Revolution's most astute and potent uh, propagandist. Most of that reputation, at least with respect to the American Revolution, is derived from this single short pamphlet, which Paine wrote and initially published anonymously uh, in January of 1776. The pamphlet is, of course, Common Sense. By almost any account, Common Sense would become uh, the most widely read and influential political pamphlet of the revolutionary era, the American Revolutionary Era. And while there's some scholarly debate about the actual number of pamphlets in circulation, Paine estimated that, that about 120,000 were in circulation. This is an outrageously uh, exaggerated claim, but it is the case that the pamphlet, uh, more copies of, of Common Sense circulated than any uh, uh, political pamphlet in the period. Um, there were 40 printings uh, in, the, uh, in the first year of the, the pamphlet's appearance in the United States in 1776 another 20 in, in Great Britain. So an immensely um, uh, remarkable uh, and, and remarkably influential document. Now, despite Paine's obvious centrality to the American Revolution, he sits awkwardly in an American founder's pantheon that includes the likes of, of Washington, Jefferson, Adams, uh, Hamilton, Franklin, these fellows that are behind the screen there, um, and so many others. Unlike these familiar figures, Paine never held elected office. He never distinguished himself through uh, military uh, activity or military prowess. Um, he had no direct involvement in the framing of our national charter, the United States Constitution. He wasn't in the United States when that was happening in 1787. Similarly, unlike most of uh, his better known peers, um, uh, Paine had very little formal education. Uh, he went to grammar school in England as a child, um, um, and he uh, went through very, very rigorous training to become an excise tax collector um, in England. Um, but beyond that, uh, no formal training, never studied the law, never uh, uh, stood before a bar to, to acquire credentials to, to, uh, to claim before a court of law, as did so many members of the founding era. Um, making Payne's status as a founder even more tenuous was the simple fact that of his 72 years, uh, he spent less than 20 living in the United States. So Paine only arrived in the United States in 1774. He was already 37 years old. 
And he would leave the country again in 1787, returning uh, in 1803 to live out his final um, six years, mostly in poverty and obscurity. Um, his, his funeral procession from lower Manhattan to uh, property that he owned in uh, um, um, New Rochelle, New York, uh, was noted simply because it was so minuscule and, and unremarkable. Um, and, and that's an interesting story why that why that, why that was. Payne never, never owned property uh, other than this farm in New Rochelle, which he only acquired because the uh, government of uh, revolutionary, the revolutionary government of New York State saw fit to reward him for his revolutionary service by giving him a confiscated loyalist farm uh, in New Rochelle. Um, and of course, Payne, Payne's uh, city of residence for most of the time that he was in uh, the United States was Philadelphia. It wasn't New York. He only went to New York um, after his return in the 19th century. Um, so this is the first story that my book tells. Again, a story of an Im immigrant Englishman who uses cutting-edge communication technology, the printing press, uh, to articulate uh, fundamental ideals behind the revolution, the American Revolution. And I have to say, if you know anything at all about Thomas Paine, most of what I've just said uh, should be familiar to you. This is the well-known Thomas Paine, the firebrand, the radical champion of American-style Republican Revolution, the pamphleteer and the propagandist. But there is another much less well-known Paine, and the second story my book tells is the story of that Thomas Paine. This story is also a story of communications and technology, um, but the technology is not the printing press, and the communication problem is not the dissemination of revolutionary ideas. The technology is architectural iron, and the communication problem is the much more uh, uh, fundamental and, and systemic one of, of finding mechanisms to bind a, a far-flung, diverse uh, American Republic uh, together. So a much more uh, a foundational, societal kind of communication problem. Um, the story of, of pain and this, this, uh, this particular uh, uh, communications and, and technological enterprise, as I tell it, uh, begins on a mild September day um, in uh, 1790. So the American Revolution is over, or well, you know, the main events of it are over, the Constitution has been ratified, etc. Um, on that day, Payne uh, stood before a 110-foot iron arch bridge on Lisson Green, which you can see here in a 19th century print. Uh, Lisson Green is at the corner, or was at the corner of Edgware Road and the new Marylebone Road, uh, just outside of Paddington, which was not a train station, but a village, um, soon to be absorbed by London's northern sprawl. Over the course of the previous few months, Payne had overseen a small crew of workmen as they erected the structure, this iron bridge, out of uh, cast iron parts shipped south from Yorkshire. For Payne, the Lisson Green Bridge was the culmination of a five-year struggle to build one of the world's first iron arch bridges. Nothing remains of the bridge, and the green has long, been, uh, long since been subsumed beneath council houses and the Marylebone flyover, which is an elevated extension of the A40 motorway. You can hardly imagine that the place was once a way station uh, for weary travelers approaching from the north, or that it served as a transit point for herdsmen moving sheep, pigs, and cattle uh, from the fields around Paddington east along Marylebone Road, which at the time was known as New Road, uh, toward Islington and then south to the, to the Smithfield Market. But in 1790, uh, Lisson Green was one of the few places near central London suited to the display of an architectural marvel. Um, so Payne's Lisson Green Bridge was composed of hundreds of cast iron bars fastened together uh, using hot rivets uh, to form a series of five parallel iron arches, the tops of which were linked by heavy uh, wooden planks. The structure loomed above the ground like a whale's arched back, perched between two modest wooden embankment towers these are the, the towers between which the structure was situated to contain the compression from the weight of the, of the, of the iron structure. 
At a distance, the low-slung low bridge rising to a height of five feet at its peak might have seemed part of the landscape. It simply emerged from the ground as a small segment of a much larger circle. The visible lattice of iron bars and a pedestrian uh, walkway were all there was to interrupt the pleasing uh, symmetry of the bridge. So it was, it was odd enough for a work of architecture to appear in a place ordinarily occupied by grazing cows, gentlemen bowlers, uh, and drunks spilling out of the nearby public house. But it was even odder that the structure should have no real functional use. Uh, Payne's bridge spanned no waterways, or there was no gorge. Um, um, for strollers on the green, its purpose uh, was entirely ornamental. Um, they, the, the bridge carried them nowhere other than above the ground. Um, nonetheless, over the course of the next few weeks, uh, a steady stream of Londoners paid a shilling uh, to traverse the bridge's gentle slope to its rounded peak, from which they could gaze upon the green and the activities on the green. The easy descent of the bridge would deposit the pedestrian back on the green with the feeling of having barely left the ground. Well, this was exactly Paine's intent. In the 18th century, movement could almost never be described uh, with uh, adjectives like gentle and easy. Whether traveling by sea or land, the risks to person and property were countless. For travelers in Paine's adopted home province of Pennsylvania, the risks were made doubly acute by a combination of climate and topography. Pennsylvania's hills, particularly in the northern and central part of the state, fed a river system that ultimately emptied into the Chesapeake and Delaware bays. For part of the year, those rivers were vital conduits for goods traveling from the back country to markets at Baltimore and Philadelphia. But for another part, they became impassable barriers. In the winter and spring months, the very same topography that fed these rivers uh, transformed them um, um, uh, into uh, impassable barriers. In the winter and spring, uh, sorry, uh, um, these rivers could ease, uh, release torrents of water and ice in the, in the spring months, rendering them neither navigable nor traversable. You couldn't navigate them, nor could you, could you cross them um, in, a, in a ferry or uh, other means. They were very dangerous. People were getting crushed between pieces of ice that flowed down the rivers and so on. Um, um, the problem transformed uh, Pennsylvania from a contiguous territory into something more like an inland archipelago. So Payne hoped that his bridge would free his fellow Pennsylvanians from this riverine burden. Once its design was endorsed and adopted in the country of his birth, he would return to America and throw the span first across the Schuylkill River. That bridge, he believed, would give rise to imitators, which in turn would transform the countryside from a place of islands to a unified empire of liberty. Um, so there is no image of the Lisson Green Bridge, but there is this image, um, which is uh, uh, of a bridge based on Payne's design. The only design that that could be, the only one that he patented, was the one that he built at, at Lisson Green. So this is presumably based on the Lisson Green uh, bridge model. This, Drawing I found in the um, <clears throat> collection of Sir John Soane, who was a, a professor of architecture at the Royal Academy in the early 19th century and has the greatest, uh, the museum continues, or the archives of the museum have, have the most uh, uh, comprehensive collection of architectural drawings um, uh, for the early 19th century, as far as I know, anywhere. Um, um, and among those drawings is this, uh, this one. Um, the, the drawing, I believe, was prepared by uh, Payne's partners in the Lisson Green Bridge. <clears throat> so the, that project was, was underwritten um, by uh, some, uh, a family that, uh, that controlled an iron foundry in Rotherham, um, uh, outside of Sheffield. Um, and uh, the, the Walker brothers, um, and they bid on the the bridge that this is uh, supposed to represent, uh, 
Sunderland Bridge, or it's a bridge over the, the Ware near the, near the town of Sunderland. So I think this was part of their proposal to get the contract to forge the parts for that bridge, which would be the second iron bridge uh, ever built in Britain. It opened in 1796, um, and this is what it looked like in the end. So you can see they didn't actually follow Payne's design um, or the design submitted by the Walker brothers. It's a little bit different um, in, its, uh, in its structural detail. Well, not surprisingly, given Payne's politics, uh, bridge building was for Payne much more than just an altruistic attempt to address a public a pressing public safety problem. It was also a scheme to apply technology to what Payne believed was the new American Republic's most urgent political problem. For Payne, that problem, once again, was most evident in his adopted home province of Pennsylvania. The state seemed to Payne to be hopelessly divided into two sections. One on the western side of the Susquehanna River and the other on the Susquehanna's eastern side. That division, Payne feared, would tear the Republic of Pennsylvania apart, and if the Republic of Pennsylvania couldn't survive, uh, there was little hope for a larger uh, United States Republic. As Payne explained to his friend, a state assemblyman from Berks County, Daniel Clymer, instead of that tranquility which Pennsylvania required and which she might have enjoyed, and instead of that internal prosperity which her independent situation put her in the power to possess, she has suffered herself to be rent into factions. For Payne, the only real mystery about this sectional division was that farmers living in the western parts of Pennsylvania, long accustomed to underrepresentation in the Pennsylvania State Assembly, maintained any allegiance to the state's government at all. The farmers, he explained to Payne, uh, to Clymer, I'm sorry, are not affected by matters which operate within the old settled parts of the state because they're not beyond the reach uh, uh, and circle of that commercial in intercourse which takes place between all the counties on the east side of the Susquehanna and Philadelphia. But they are entirely within the circle of commerce belonging to another state, that of Baltimore. So he's saying these, these western farmers are doing business not with Philadelphia, which is the capital of, of Pennsylvania, obviously, at this time, uh, but with a, a, a commercial agents in a, in a completely different state and in a city that has no political connection uh, to Pennsylvania. Happy would it be for Pennsylvania, wrote one newspaper correspondent in 1787, if her boundaries were comprised by the Susquehanna. We should be more compact and united. Sorry, I have a contemporary map here, an 18th century map, and you can see this is the Susquehanna here. Most of you are certainly familiar with that. Just to the west is, is York County, and then the eastern counties uh, to the east of the river. Happy would it be for Pennsylvania, again, this uh, 1787 uh, newspaper correspondent, if her boundaries were comprised by the Susquehanna. We should be more compact and more united. For this commentator, there was simply no way to forge a single political community from Pennsylvania's disparate parts. The state would be better off just acknowledging reality and separating its eastern and western sections. Only then would commerce and politics truly align, and only then would the Republic of Pennsylvania function as a single cohesive political entity. Well, Payne's solution was less radical. Uh, he didn't propose the secession of eastern Pennsylvania. Instead, what he proposed uh, was, was the opposite. He proposed deploying technology for the purpose of, of tying uh, the state more closely together, facilitating the kind of commercial connections that in turn, as Payne's liberalism would have it, would nurture political connections. And, and Payne believed uh, that, that durable, um, uh, long-lasting iron bridges, this was the way to do this, that, that these these structures could have this uh, profound political impact. Um, well, as you may have guessed, Payne's scheme to address Pennsylvania's political problems uh, and to do so with, through architecture um, didn't really work. So in a sense, my book is a story of failure. Um, wood, it turns out, 
is a much cheaper and much more easily used uh, architectural technology than, than is iron. And so despite Payne's strenuous attempts to make it otherwise, also, of course, a much more abundant uh, uh, material in the, in the early United States. Um, so despite Payne's very strenuous uh, attempts to make it otherwise, the United States would be a nation of wooden bridges. Um, and I have a few examples uh, of, of what this meant. Um, so the first of these, which is uh, in some ways the re most remarkable, uh, crosses the Schuylkill um, uh, near where present-day Market Street is. This was built by a uh, well-known New England bridge builder, Timothy Palmer, um, completed in 1805. Um, its a, a span is about 500 feet. It's three arches. Payne really didn't like this. He was very frustrated, uh, partly because he believed that the, uh, the piers that supported the center arches of the bridge were a vulnerability, and so his advocacy, he advocated a, a single arch uh, uh, and thought that iron was the way to do this. Um, uh, so Payne um, long recognized, and, and again, one of the reasons that he advocated iron, um, that the qualities that made wood bridges and wood bridge construction uh, so cost effective also made it vulnerable. Rain, wind, snow, and ice combined with the pulverizing effects of horse hooves and wagon wheels would eventually induce wood rot, which in turn would weaken the structure um, and, and the bridges would fail. But 19th century American bridge builders came up with an ingenious solution to this problem in the form of the ever ubiquitous uh, fixture of 19th century, the 19th century American landscape, and that is, of course, the covered bridge uh, uh, covering uh, over the, 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 uh, uh, the, the structural elements of the bridge to protect those elements so that, that they could be preserved uh, in the face of the um, climatic uh, intrusions. And you can see here, there's a small detail that shows the covering that was later applied to the, um, um, th this uh, Middle Ferry Bridge, uh, designed and built by a Philadelphia uh, Quaker uh, carpenter and architect, uh, Owen Biddle. Um, so this is another, the second permanent bridge. Permanent is, the, uh, is, a, is an important designation because prior to these bridges, uh, any bridge across the Schuylkill would have been a floating bridge, um, which by definition was impermanent simply because in spring months when the river surged and floodwaters came down with uh, ice and so on, they always got washed away. The bridges would usually have to be pulled in um, in those months to protect them. Um, and, and so the designation permanent is significant here. Um, this bridge uh, was um, designed and built, the structural elements were designed and built by a German immigrant named Louis Vernvog, who uh, designed and built a number of bridges in, um, uh, in the mid-Atlantic. And the bridge, this is one of the earliest ones that he built, um, and it was called uh, the Colossus um, because uh, it, its 300-foot arch uh, was the longest uh, single arch span um, uh, anywhere in, 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 in the Americas at the time, um, and, and certainly in North America. Um, in addition to the sheer breadth of the span, um, uh, this great wooden bridge cut a stunning figure as it rose over the river. Its gently curving arch, immortalized in countless prints, uh, engraved on Staffordshire dinnerware, um, and capturing um, uh, the imagination of, of travelers. So much of the bridge's celebrity is owing to its covering, uh, which was designed by the Philadelphia uh, architect, neoclassical uh, architect Robert Mills, whose most famous commission would be the, the Washington Monument. So that, that's the, the part that you see is, is the part that Mills uh, designed. Well, unfortunately, in 1838, uh, the Colossus uh, fell to a well-known hazard of wooden architecture. Um, it, it, it was uh, torched by an arsonist and fell into the river, and, and that was the end of that. Um, so let me conclude here. Uh, Payne went to his bridge, uh, went to his bridge, went to his grave, I'm sorry. Uh, the bridge maybe 
helped to facilitate that <laughs> process. Um, uh, he, he went to his grave believing that, that internal improvements, or what we would now call infrastructure, uh, would be the binding sinew of a sprawling American republic. In Paine's lifetime, this somewhat utopian ideal went largely unrealized. The first permanent Schuylkill Bridge uh, would be built before Paine died, but internal improvement on anything like the, the scale that Paine imagined uh, only began after his death in 1809. The National Road and the Erie Canal, the early American Republic's two greatest internal impro improvements, were begun in 1811 and 1817, respectively. So these extraordinary public works, and it is significant that they were, in fact, public works undertaken with, with uh, by the standards of the time, massive uh, public uh, support, financial support. Uh, these public works, along with hundreds of other less well-known examples, would draw the country together in ways uh, that even Paine uh, could never have imagined. But of course, as we know, with the privilege of hindsight, Technology didn't solve the problem of American sectionalism. And nowhere was that more apparent than along the Mason-Dixon line, the eponymous dividing line that separated uh, the slave uh, south from the uh, anti-slavery north. And it's significant, as you can see from this map, this is the original Mason-Dixon line, so this is the line, the eponymous line, this is the line that was surveyed by two members of the society uh, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon, they surveyed the tangent line, which separates Delaware from Maryland, and then they surveyed the west line, which uh, actually the west and east line, so it runs from Wilmington uh, out west. Um, um, and you can see that this line uh, cuts through the region that Payne was complaining about when he was talking about these renegade uh, western uh, Pennsylvanians. They're doing business uh, along the east uh, shore of the Susquehanna down to the uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, where, where they could more easily get to Baltimore, bring their goods to, to market. I call this region uh, in my new book, Greater Baltimore. Um, but it does raise the question uh, of, of how uh, we know that, that Payne's vision ultimately failed, um, and we know that Payne had complaints about uh, how the political economy of Pennsylvania was affected by uh, its riverine uh, challenges. Um, um, this work led me to wonder how slavery uh, affected that problem, how slavery contributed to the sort of state level um, um, uh, sectionalism that Payne identified. Um, and so to try to answer that question, uh, I, I've written another book um, which appeared this month uh, with Harvard University Press. So, I apologize for flogging product, but I'm going to blame Peter on that. He said I could do this, so <laughs> thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for returning us to the period of our <laughs> origins in the APS, and I'm sure people have questions. Yes, here. Here comes the microphone, Nicholas. Yeah. Uh, Nick, Nick Lemon from New York. Um, with apologies for being presentist. Suddenly, in the Biden administration, we're back in the world of internal improvements. Um, you know, the green energy transition, the Infrastructure Act, et cetera. Why is this happening? And all of a sudden, it seems, and what will the effects be? Um, <laughs> Where's your crystal ball? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I could cop historian to that one. I don't deal in the present. Um, what, what I will say is um, I'm, I'm a historian of political economy, um, which, as I understand it, means that I, I view politics and economics as inextricably intertwined. I don't believe you can understand either without the other. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge here, um, I mean, the politics of this, well, let me, let, me, let me juxtapose the contemporary politics 
to the, the 18th century politics. So the contemporary politics are that the one thing government can do is spend money to build stuff. I know this very well as a, as a uh, faculty member at a large southern public university. Um, um, this is literally the only thing about which there's rarely any uh, political controversy or, or, or pushback. If you want to build a building, that's no problem. Um, it's a fixed cost. Uh, it's, you know, it, well, it's not, but it's supposed to be. Um, 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 and obviously this is, I think, you know, uh, it's not a profound thing to say that one thing that makes uh, build back better, or at least was intended to make it politically digestible, was its job creation potential. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would say about that is that uh, skepticism about the capacity of government, uh, government expenditure to generate economic activity, um, uh, you know, this exists now. There's certainly a, 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 a very uh, intense, um, 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 you know, uh, strain of thought that, that, you know, they talk about picking winners and losers and all this kind of stuff. Um, um, a, a version of that uh, existed in, in the 18th century. Um, uh, and the, but the problem was uh, less the idea that government, I mean, it wasn't an unfamiliar thing for a government to, to patronize and to spend money. Um, the problem, is, and, and this is kind of where it gets a little bit you know, the, the contemporary linkages are, are sort of troubling. Um, but, the, but the primary complaint in, in the period that I study um, was not so much that government is trying to, you know, spend money, put money in people's pockets, employ people. The problem was that in assuming the financial responsibility for internal improvements, government was empowering itself excessively. And, and government was uh, intertwining itself with um, the world of, of finance and of legal incorporation. Um, nobody thinks corporations are particularly dangerous or it's not even a notable thing. Um, um, but in the 18th century, uh, there's an intense sense that corporations are actually problematic and dangerous and, and represent potential rivals to state authority. So that, that's kind of, you know, it's, it's uh, yeah. Thank you. Excellent question. <laughs> And thank you. Annie informs me that was our last question. So thank you very much. It was fascinating.